Created in 1887 by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes is supposed to be the ultimate master of deductive reasoning, though there's some debate as to whether or not the method he actually uses is closer to inductive reasoning. In any case, here's an example of how that's supposed to work. <clears throat> Fact number one. People tend to like fictional characters who they can identify with personally. Fact number two. As conceived by Doyle in the original 56 short stories and four novels, Sherlock Holmes is a smug, introverted, substance-abusing, pathologically antisocial intellectual snob who can only ever be bothered to interact with most of the outside world when it provides him the opportunity to demonstrate how much smarter he is than everyone else. Thus, from those two facts, I think you can easily deduce fact number three. Movie Bob loves himself some Sherlock Holmes. So, what did I think of this newest variation? Honestly, disappointingly average movie, but a great Holmes and possibly the best Watson ever. Call it a mixed bag leaning on the good. Now, there's been a lot of back and forth about accuracy on this one, i.e. whether or not director Guy Ritchie et al. have committed some kind of pop culture mutilation by reimagining Holmes as an ass-kicking adventurer, some saying yay, others nay. Here's the thing about that. It's pointless. The fact is, Doyle mainly kept doing home stories for the money and never took the franchise all that seriously. Hell, at one point he got so damn sick of the character he killed him off, only to bring him back to life, essentially inventing the retcon, one of the many, many aspects of modern geek culture that we owe to this series. Hell, it even had some of the first fanboys, they call ourselves, uh, themselves, Sherlockians. In fact, uh, sorry, sorry, back on track. In any case, things like continuity of characterization don't really exist in Sherlock Holmes, so there's always been a lot of wiggle room. Interestingly, though, while it's clear that the filmmakers have engaged in some heavy cherry-picking, ramping incidental canonical mentions of the hero's boxing skills and gadget fixation up to 11 in order to justify taking the Pirates of the Caribbean PG-13 period action comedy approach, but in terms of personality, Robert Downey Jr.'s Holmes is in some respects closer to the text than most of the others that came before. This is really the first time anyone's really gone for the sketchy, disheveled, undiagnosed OCD aspect of this character, and Downey really is a joy to watch in it. Even better, though, is Jude Law as Watson, finally a Sherlock Holmes movie that doesn't feel the need to artificially increase Holmes' apparent genius by making Watson a bumbling fool or a paper-thin straight man. And Law does a remarkable job bringing the role of Doyle's hard-bitten, disabled veteran, cursed and blessed to have the challenge-seeking nutcase for a best friend to life better than just about anyone has before. The chemistry between the two men is the best possible kind of buddy cop platonic macho affection and gives desperately needed weight to the film's hard-working B story in which Watson's impending marriage has Holmes acting out like an angry little boy, bewildered that his best bud in the whole world suddenly wants to forsake the clubhouse to hang around with some dumb old girl. It's a shame, then, that the main story is pretty much a waste of time. Instead of giving this crackerjack new Holmes-Watson team a mystery worthy of them, the film drops them into a bunch of third-generation Dan Brown-style schlock that's way too damn easy to figure out and isn't really much of a mystery. They didn't need Sherlock Holmes for this case, and Cyclopedia Brown could have fit this one in between Bugs Meany's latest caper and the ongoing mystery of why Sally Kimball was never around when Xena was on. And Sherlockians will also probably be glad to see Rachel McAdams turn up as Irene Adler, the supposed love of Holmes' life. Adler is kind of the Boba Fett of the Sherlock Holmes stories, and that fans are obsessed with her, even though she only ever showed up once and was never really all that important. Here, she's inevitably recast as a Catwoman analog, and while McAdams is always fun to watch, she's really only on hand to lay obvious groundwork for a sequel, about which I'll say nothing other than to point out that someone was paying really close attention to the box office differential between these two movies. Like most of the buddy cop movies it's reverse-engineered from, the new Sherlock Holmes ends up overcoming an average, and when you get right down to it, pretty dopey main story, because it's really all just an excuse to give the two-man show stuff to play off against. Downey and Law make a perfect team, and hopefully if this one clicks, the next one will have the decency to give them something better to do with their time. Still, it's a hell of a lot better than last year's Christmas Day detective movie, though it doesn't change the fact that the best modern redo of Sherlock Holmes by far is still Dr. House. Man, this is not that positive of a review, and I was way too nice to this movie. This movie 
doesn't hold up at all. It really sucks. And I'm not just saying that because it wasn't that long after this that we got the better, newer version of Holmes with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. It, th this just is not very good. I still think Jude Law is very good as Watson, uh, but I feel like I was probably like bending over backwards to be nice to this one because it was so assumed that it was going to suck and that it didn't totally suck, it felt like. But uh, having watched this one again recently and then the sequel is so bad and I was so glad that Guy Ritchie went back to the more traditional Guy Ritchie stuff and also, you know, the, his Aladdin movie, not terrible, I didn't think. But yeah, this was just garbage. It, it almost feels like a parody of what people think it would be. I mean, it really sucks. And that's, like, it's a shame how much this sucks. You wouldn't think that this would suck this much, but it does. I would honestly rather watch the Will Ferrell Sherlock Holmes movie. Do you even remember that happened, by the way? That they made a, a movie where Will Ferrell and John C. Riley are Holmes and Watson? Remember, remember that happened? like many years after that as just a thing and it was so also so bad that no one remembers it but it was supposed to be funny you forgot that happened and it sounds like a funny idea i promise you it's not and i would rather watch it than this so uh yeah i might throw that on uh as a uh, i'm uh, yeah i think i'm gonna do that i think i'm just gonna put that review on after this and just to prove to you that that existed but so yeah but this sucked that sucked and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, en enjoy that because I'm gonna stick that on after this. It's easy to see why Holmes and Watson must have looked like a great idea on paper. Will Ferrell and John C. Riley have great natural chemistry as a comedy double act in Talladega Nights and Step Brothers. Why not cast them as funny versions as some famous done to death fictional duo people have seen dozens of movies about and do a parody? And even though neither of them are British, Sherlock Holmes even seems like a natural fit given that Ferrell excels at playing egomaniacal blowhards and Riley is a master of innately sympathetic second bananas going all the way back to Boogie Nights. So Will Ferrell is Sherlock Holmes, Riley is Dr. Watson. Sure, I can imagine the funny version of that and I'll have to keep imagining it because this movie sucks. I can't say for sure that this is the worst movie or even the worst comedy that either of the main duo have done, but it's definitely the worst thing they've done together. A waste of talent that doesn't so much misuse both of their gifts as it does willingly throw them away in favor of gags that alternately feel suited to different comics entirely or nobody in particular. About half the scenes and ideas feel made up on the spot, and those are the ones that feel almost serviceable, while the other stranger, more elaborately thought out business feels like it was intended for a Tim and Eric project, though they might have made it work. Here, it definitely does not. The end result doesn't have much satirical insight to either the literary tradition of the endlessly adapted Sherlock Holmes stories or the general pop culture presence of the characters, which feels bizarre considering that the character has had so much more modern resurgence over the last decade between House, the Robert Downey Jr. movies, Sherlock, Elementary, and now Miss Sherlock on HBO Asia, you'd think that with all these different reworkings already out there, Holmes and Watson would have more to work from, or at least try, than retreading familiar territory about men not being able to express platonic affection and awkwardly unequal partnerships. And yet, not only does the film not have anywhere to go but there with its central dynamic, it can't even be bothered to do so with much comedic or even character depth. Half the time it feels like both actors would like to drop the accents and costumes and cut to the chase of every character beat by turning to the audience and saying, hey, you remember that one part from one of our better movies, this is that, but for this setting. You got it? Okay, moving on. And then skip to whatever the punchline was supposed to be and go home early. For what it's worth, the big idea for this one is that this incarnation of Sherlock Holmes attained his superior intelligence by forcing himself not to have emotions, which has left him totally clueless as to the emotional abuse he's been inflicting via neglect on Dr. Watson, who just wants his efforts as Sherlock's sidekick and hype man to be appreciated with the reward of near equality in their partnership. This dynamic becomes further strained as they attempt to thwart a threatened assassination of the Queen by Ray Fiennes as Dr. Moriarty, with the aid of Rebecca Hall and Lauren Lapkus as a pair of American female doctors who serve as would-be love interests and foils for about 20 jokes too many about characters acting like anachronistic Victorian views on science and ideas are actually very advanced and progressive, in fact. Frustratingly, there is the germ of an idea for a decent Sherlock Holmes spoof buried in the outline of the main narrative, with Ferrell's overly cocksure Holmes so convinced of his own brilliance and conversely the brilliance of anyone who could outwit him that he cheerfully overlooks the obvious suspects for being too obvious and dismisses mundane but perfectly sensible solutions. That's kind of funny. At the very least, it's the only recurring funny bit in the movie in theory, and it builds to a final reveal that feels like it was meant to dovetail with the B story about Sherlock's ignorance of human emotion where the joke would have been, are you kidding me, literally any idiot would have solved this based on that piece of information alone, but then it doesn't because it feels like they recognized the joke wasn't playing and cut the beats that was supposed to actually let it play out, so instead the main narrative mystery actually kind of gets solved off screen. It's very bizarre. Instead, we're left with a couple great comedians doing material that's beneath them, interspread with painful jokes about old-timey versions of selfie sticks, drunk dialing, Holmes inventing pro wrestling pay-per-view, complete with Braun Strowman cameo and riffs about how American elections could never accidentally put a wealthy tyrant in charge, ha ha ha, and livened only sporadically by moments of off-kilter weirdness like Lapkus' character having been apparently raised by cats, which pays off in no particular way. Then again, 
digging too far into the esoteric problems with Holmes and Watson obscures the more pressing matter that it's simply just not a well-made film. It's clearly been hacked to pieces in the edit and wasn't made with particular care to begin with. In order to get it into semi-releasable shape, the jokes don't land, the characterizations don't fit from scene to scene, the cinematography and direction are bland and ugly to look at, it's embarrassing watching people like Steve Coogan and Hugh Laurie show up for phoned-in cameos with nothing to actually do, Laurie doesn't even speak for most of his performance, good work if you can get it, it's an utterly unpleasant, nearly unwatchable mess of a thing that only manages to escape being the worst thing in most multiplexes right at the moment by virtue of some theaters still having Welcome to Marwin booked on a couple screens.